It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's Rutgers Business School Virtual Lunch and Learn Series webinar. I'd like to thank Brian Doyle for joining us today. Brian is the president of Holden Advisors and a recognized expert in helping organizations lead and communicate with the five different generations in today's workforce. He speaks and consults with audiences worldwide. Brian is also the author of Gray Goldfish, Navigating the Gray Areas to Successfully Lead Every Generation. His leadership experience began as a U.S. Air Force pilot, where he commanded 31 combat missions in Kosovo. Brian was also responsible for transporting the presidential motorcade around the world. When he transitioned to business leadership, Brian led a Six Sigma program for General Electric, as well as sales and marketing at Genworth Financial. He has since focused his efforts on improving the leadership of his clients, resulting in over $1 billion in increased profit. Brian earned a bachelor's degree in astrophysics from the United States Air Force Academy and a master's degree in systems engineering from St. Mary's University. We are excited to learn from you, Brian, and please take it from here. Great, thank you, Margaret. Thanks everybody for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, Picture this with me, if you will. I'm sitting in the boardroom of a Fortune 500 company. At the head of the table is the president and CEO, and assembled around the table are his direct reports. The senior vice president's in charge of every function in the business. Immediately to my left is an empty chair, which is supposed to be occupied by my 25-year-old employee. As the president is telling his latest story, I start to hear it from down the hall. Flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop. And I can tell by the frequency of the flipping and the flopping that my millennial employee knows that she's late for the meeting and is now running. She gets there just in time, sits down as the president is finishing his story and she says, hey, that was a great story. You guys ready to get started? She then begins to give her presentation, which is insightful and thoughtful and organized. And it's about why our sales team is not performing as well as we think they should. She engages or tries to engage the different members uh, of the boardroom by asking questions. And she talks about the competition, our products, the individual salespeople. But as she tries to engage those different people around the room, the body language I see is his folded arms and heads tilted back and heavy sighs. She asks if there are any questions and I follow up at the end of her presentations if there's any questions or comments. And we hear a little bit of, oh, that was good, you know, nice job, but not really any engagement. The meeting adjourns I go back to my office and that's when the parade begins. And at first it's a parade of senior vice presidents and they all say something similar, which is, what was she thinking? She shows up late for the meeting. She acts like she owns the place. She calls me by my first name, even though I'm way senior to her. She wasn't even here at work yesterday. She's probably goofing off instead of working on this presentation. Brian, you got to do something about this. And then after that parade stopped, my millennial employee came to me and she said, Brian, that was BS, except I'm pretty sure she spelled out the acronym. She said, I worked really hard in that presentation. I tried to engage everybody who was there at the table, but no one wanted to participate. I even worked from home yesterday so that I would be fully prepared you got to do something about those people. And so it was at that moment that I realized that there was a huge disconnect and one person's perspective doesn't always align with the perspectives of others. You see, we all have a mental image of the perfect employee, what they look like, what they talk like, what they act like. And to a large extent, that's influenced by our own experiences, how we were raised, where we went to school, our friends, where we worked and our coworkers. In other words, 
our view is largely influenced by our own generation. And if we only interacted with people from our own generation, there'd be a lot less friction, but we'd miss out on some great experiences, ideas, and perspectives. We're at a very unique time in history where there were five full generations in today's workforce. These are the generations we're gonna be talking about today. And as you look at the bottom of the page, you see that generation Z has that tilde next to age 12 to 24 years old. And the reason that's there is because we are in an absolute breaking point in terms of that generation. There are people who are gonna be very influenced by the pandemic and the coronavirus environment that we're in now. Is it exactly at 12 years old? We're not sure yet. We're not sure how everybody's gonna develop, but I can tell you that there is a breaking point right now for some of our younger people that are gonna create a new generation. So let's start talking about first, the oldest generation, the matures. The matures are about duty, honor, and country. They have lived through some very austere times and are greatly influenced by the Great Depression. Either their parents lived in it or they lived in it. And when you think about our recent struggle, so the Great Recession of about 2008 to 2012, unemployment reached 10%. And we've seen that a little bit recently too. But for this generation, homelessness reached 10%. Unemployment reached 25%. This is a group of people who lived through some really hard times. And I think the best example of them are the B-17 pilots in World War II. So this is a group of people who got up in the morning in England, got in their airplanes, flew to Germany, dropped their bombs, and 25% of those airplanes were shot down. The remaining planes and pilots came back, landed in England, went to bed, got up the next day and did it again. And 25% of those airplanes were shot down again. So if we were in a, in a, a real classroom or a real auditorium, I'd be asking you to raise your hand and tell me which one of you would keep going back to work if 25% of your coworkers were killed doing the job you do. I would venture to guess that there would be no hands up but this is what these people did of this generation. And there's a quote from a member of the mature generation that I think really encapsulates this. It's General George Patton. And he says, if I do my full duty, the rest will take care of itself. He's not worried about office politics. He's not worried about time off. He's doing his full duty and the rest will take care of itself. Now, the baby boomers, they're defined by their work. If you ask a baby boomer to tell you about him or herself, they will immediately start with something like, well, I'm a vice president at this company and I supervise this many people. We work on this sort of projects for these, these types of clients. They'll tell you all about their work environment. If you let them talk long enough, they'll eventually tell you that they're married, they have a family, maybe they've got some hobbies, but they're defined by their work. So I want you to think about if you're in an office environment where you're going in these days, find a baby boomer's office. And if you're not, think about the baby boomer's office or maybe what you see behind you on, on Zoom or WebEx. I bet you see plaques and certificates everywhere. They represent the steps that the baby boomer has taken in his or her career. And I'll tell you, I was with a baby boomer not that long ago, walked into his office, and I noticed there was a framed certificate on the wall. So I looked a little closer, thought it might be a big deal. It was a certificate from Microsoft, a course that he'd taken. So I was like, wow, this, this must be huge. So I looked, ladies and gentlemen, this certificate was from the early 1990s. Windows didn't even exist in the early 1990s but it was important to this individual because it represented a step that he took to get to this point in his career. Being able to show off your career, getting FaceTime with leadership, 
is very important to baby boomers. And as we think about, and I'm gonna drop these in um, throughout our talk today, in terms of the coronavirus, how that affects the different generations. Well, baby boomers really take pride in working odd hours and getting some special face time with, uh, with leadership. But when everybody works from home, they don't really have the opportunity to be in their office late. So this is something that's, that's different for them and affects how they produce work. When it comes to Generation X, this is a generation that is oftentimes called cynical because they question authority. And there's two main things that have happened in their lifetimes that cause them to question authority. Number one is they've seen lifelong employment end. So if you think about the mature generation, it was not uncommon for them to work for the same company for 30 or 40 years and then retire with a pension. But Generation X saw their parents get laid off and laid off in mass for the first time really in history. The second thing that caused them to start questioning authority and not really believe in, in corporations and, and maybe lack a little bit of trust is that their parents were divorced at the greatest rates in history, even compared to subsequent generations. So again, that erodes that level of trust. If you're of a certain age, you might be familiar with the term latchkey children. That's Generation X. They were often raised by single parents. Those parents had to work to make ends meet. And so these kids came home from school, let themselves into the house, did their own homework, made their own meal. And so they started to learn how to be self-sufficient problem solvers. They had to let themselves in latchkey children. So that's great if you're working by yourself. It's not so, not so good if you are responsible for leading a team that requires more hands-on oversight, maybe more consistent oversight. And particularly as we think about this pandemic, if there are employees of Generation X managers, they might struggle with making sure that they get that, that consistent touch with them when everybody's working from home. And as a recipient of communication, Generation X is already questioning authority. So virtual communication had better come across as genuine or they're gonna question it. So let me ask the audience and Margaret's gonna help us with a poll right here. On a scale of one to 10 and 10 being, I love working with this generation. These guys are awesome, I totally get them. To one, I do not understand these people. They don't make any sense to me. Let's, let's look at the matures. How do you like working with matures? Love them? Uh, not so much. So great. Our audience is weighing in. Um, they've been pretty kind thus far. But we're seeing it move around a little bit. So um, I'm going to let it go for a couple more seconds before I end it and, um, and share out the results. Right. Are you able to see the results? I I, I can. Looks like uh, um, looks like what you said there, Margaret. Um, you know, kind of a bell curve, but uh, around eight is uh, is best. So people are feeling pretty good about working with matures. That's awesome. All right. So let's clear, let's clear our minds and clear the screen and, and it's going to be the, the same sort of poll, but now we're talking about baby boomers. Again, 10, love these guys, really enjoy working with them. One, do not understand this generation. Ooh, mix, mixed feelings so far. Yes. Very mixed feelings so far. <laughs> Looks like uh, maybe we've got some baby boomers voting and maybe we have uh, some folks who are not baby boomers voting. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end that and then uh, share the results. All right, so maybe a little bit lower. We're, we're a little less generous. 
Okay, one more for right now. Same question, but let's talk about uh, Generation X. How do you feel about them? 10, love Generation X, totally get along with them, totally understand them. One, mm -mm. Well, this is staying mostly on the higher end of the, of the scale. Yep, and um, I'm not seeing too many Gen X haters here. <laughs> Previous generations had, had, had low end. Oh, there is okay. one, two. Okay, All right. I'm going to end that and share the results. Very cool. Okay, for right now, I have one more poll for you. We've talked about all the older generations. Now, let me ask you about millennials, please. On a scale of one to 10, 10, I love these folks. I totally get along with them. I understand them. One, no. There was a, there was a quick vote there with one. Somebody was poised for this one to jump in. And a lot of variation. Yes, even more variation than the previous poll. Give me another second or so. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. All right, so 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 big distribution here, and I appreciate everybody participating. That that that's awesome. There was a lot of variation there, particularly with the millennials. And I'll tell you what, when we're done with today, I bet you that tightens up a little bit and it moves to the higher end of the scale. See, because all the generations are different. They all have their idiosyncrasies, but we're at least used to working with matures, baby boomers, and Gen Xers. We're just not as familiar with millennials, and then we're going to talk about Gen Z, too, and even less familiar with them. So let's start with why the millennials are different. And first off, it's because the millennials are the trophy kids. If you're a millennial and they were 10 kids in a race and you got first place in that running race, you got a trophy. If you were 10th place in that running race, you got a trophy. And as you can see from this picture, sometimes the trophies were as big as the children themselves. And I can tell you that that is my son on that top step with the giant trophy. When he brought that home, I said to him, son, it's all downhill from here, buddy. You're not gonna keep getting giant trophies but it starts to set expectations. And those expectations happen in school as well. So I have a friend who's an elementary school teacher. I asked her, what color do you grade the papers in? She said purple. I said, well, why don't you grade them in red like they used to be? She said, well, red hurts their self-esteem. And it's not just elementary school. There's a professor at Duke University who instead of grading her students, she asked the students to grade each other. So any guesses on what the average grade in that class is? You don't even need to write it in. It's an A. So it starts to set these expectations from an early age that roll into the work environment. The other aspect here is that parents are way more involved with their children. So as a, as a side gig, I am an Air Force reservist. And part of my job is to mentor and evaluate high school students for entry into the Air Force Academy. And so I was interviewing a student who I asked, I said, did you bring your resume with you? Because I like to use them as a basis for the conversation. He said, oh yeah, yeah, here's my resume. Should be pretty good. My parents worked on it last night. And I thought to myself, how weird that his parents worked on his resume. And then I thought to myself, how weird that he told me. But he told me because he was raised as his parents' friend. They've been helping him with projects his entire life. And it doesn't make sense that this would be any different. They're trying to help him get ahead. They're trying to do the right thing for their son. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal, a businessman was given a project with a deadline 
His supervisor gave it to him, told him what to do, left. The deadline came and went. His supervisor came back to him and said, hey, so where's the project? He said, oh man, I forgot. Why didn't you remind me? Well, it sounds crazy, but if you've been reminded of deadlines your entire life, should work really feel that much different? Maybe your expectations are that it isn't. And I'll tell you, it's not because the parents don't care about their children. It's in fact, they care about them more. When I was a child and I got too excitable and too rambunctious in the house, my mother would send me out to go ride my bike and she would tell me to come back when the street lights come on. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't have a phone. I didn't even have a watch. My mother didn't know where I was and I was supposed to come back when it got dark. But that's how parents treated their kids at that time, much more self-sufficient. Self and I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. This is an ad from the 1970s, the Prince Small, so let me blow it up for you. It says, the rear of the wagon is a play area. If you can't see it, there is a baby lying on a cot in the back of a station wagon. Nobody's wearing a seatbelt, but that's how it was back then. And in fact, if you think, particularly your older generations here on the line, you probably never wore a seatbelt even in the front seat. And you didn't need one because if your mom or dad was gonna stop short, they'd stick out their arm and hold you in your seat. You didn't need a seatbelt, or at least that's how they did it back then. Of course you needed one. Nowadays, kids are sitting in a padded five-point harness. It is a better solution, but it's also a way different solution. So with that as context as to why the millennials are different, let's talk about how the millennials are different. The millennials are group oriented and they are collaborative leaders. And that is a great thing because when you're in business, you know that it's not enough just to have a great idea. You have to have other people buy into your idea. You have to have other people help you out to achieve something great. The millennials are already good at this because they've worked on projects in school where they're, they're group projects. It does come with some, uh, some downside, however, though. So going back to my experiences interviewing high school students for the Air Force Academy, it's typical for me to ask the question, so tell me about your leadership experience. And somebody will say something like, oh, I was on the prom committee. I'm like, oh, great. So what you do on the prom committee? Well, there were five of us and we worked on every aspect of the dance. Okay, cool. So what part exactly did you do? Well, there were five of us and we all worked together. We were a good team. Okay, that's great. But you specifically, what specifically did you own and you were in charge of for the dance? And the response I get is, there were five of us and we all worked together. And so as business people, particularly as business leaders, if we're going to assign a millennial a project where they have to work on their own, they might not have as much experience doing that. And so we're gonna talk later on about how to overcome that a little bit. It's also harder during this pandemic because they're used to working as teams. And there is the opportunity to use Zoom or, or something similar to collaborate. Absolutely every generation is doing this. However, it's not quite the same as sitting in the same room as somebody. So that's a challenge that, that we're facing right now. Now the millennials are also very comfortable with diversity. And if you think about the future of business in this world, it is not a bunch of old white men. So having a group of people who are used to working with people who aren't exactly like them is absolutely an advantage. So the millennials bring that to the table too. 
The millennials are also multitasking experts. If you are a millennial or you know one, you absolutely know that they can sit on the couch while they're streaming Netflix, doing work on their laptop, Snapchatting with somebody, checking out social media while they're eating a bag of Cheetos. And to an older generation, that's going to feel unfocused. Like, how could you be doing five things at one time? But when you think about the flow of information that comes into us, don't you want somebody who can deal with different flows of information and actually do more than one thing at a time? Yeah, probably. Now, a challenge is that millennials have huge goals, but sometimes struggle with the execution. And I'll give you an example from my own childhood. I went to my dad one day, he was watching TV, and this was before you could pause live TV. So when I stood in front of the box, he actually had to listen to me and you know, converse so that I could get out of the way. And I said, dad, I wanna be a professional football player. And he said, you'll never be a professional football player. Look at you, you're skinny. Those are big, strong men. That'll never happen. And so I was, I was crushed. So I started to walk away and, and my dad, who is a good man said, Brian, you wanna be a professional football player? I said, yeah, dad, I do. He said, why don't you go mow the lawn? Lawn mowing builds muscles. And then he went back to watching TV. That's the sort of feedback that older generations got from their parents. Millennials did not get that sort of feedback. What they got was, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything because you're special. And even the word special means different things for different generations. So for the millennials, it means every person is unique. The future possibilities are endless. For Generation X, it's reserved for people with physical and mental disabilities, like the Special Olympics. And for the two older generations, it is an insult. As in, what do you think you are? Special? This is a chart of how long millennials expect to pay their dues. You'll see that, that small bar, 16% expect to pay their dues for less than one year. 51% expect to pay their dues for one to two years. So ladies and gentlemen, on average, millennials expect to, or, or two thirds of millennials expect to pay their dues for less than two years. So I'll take you back to that, that mature generation again. The guy who's working in the factory for 30 years before he gets promoted to foreman. It's absolutely different. And it's different because we have set expectations with trophies and grading and everything else that, gosh, you know what? This should come to me a little faster than it should to other generations. And what's tough in particular now in the, this era of the coronavirus is that our Zoom meetings stack up back to back to back to back. And it is easy for junior employees to start feeling left behind or start feeling ignored because there's not the opportunity to walk down the hall and talk to somebody and, and converse and maybe get a little career guidance or something like that. So, we have to think about ways to one, connect with our millennial employees, and two, think about ways that we can help them advance, even if we can't give them a promotion or more, more money. That might be maybe more client-facing responsibilities or leading a team, something that can give them a, a, a step forward, even if we don't have extra money to, to throw around, because you know obviously that's not always the case. So that's the millennials, but there's a generation behind them that we call Generation Z. 
So let's have another poll with, with these guys. Remember, these are people who are just starting into the workforce, 24, maybe even 25 years old. On a scale of one to 10, just like before, 10 being I love working with these employees, one being I don't understand them, this is terrible. Where do you put Generation Z? Getting quite, quite a mix um, coming in. Some of the questions that we've received so far um, have been curious about um, you know, who is giving which answer and our polling has a little bit of a limited um, capabilities, but I can understand why they'd wanna know who was answering um, you know, with which type of response for each one. Uh, I think it is uh, relatively safe to say that most generations understand their own generation uh, or appreciate their own generation a little bit more than others. Um, but you know what? Sometimes it's hard to see the label on the ketchup bottle when you're inside the bottle. So uh, it's worth understanding all these different generations. And sometimes over time, our, our perceptions of which generation uh, we appreciate changes a little bit. Uh, let's see, Margaret. So the, the poll is pretty varied again, um, kind of like uh, our millennial poll. Great. Hey, thanks everybody for, for participating in this too. Awesome. So let's talk you know, more about Generation Z. And unfortunately, this sign is not foreign to members of Generation Z. They've seen a lot of economic struggles because they had their formative years in the great recession of 2008 to about 2012. They saw layoffs and they saw foreclosures and they saw their parents' 401ks or savings shrink drastically. And when you have these three elements shaping your childhood, you lose much of the willingness to commit to a corporation or a corporate environment. Hey, you know what? These guys aren't taking care of me. And it's interesting how it manifests itself. So there was a, a survey of high school seniors and 61% said that they would prefer to be an entrepreneur when they graduate. 61%, that's a gigantic number. And this environment has helped spawn, along with a ton of technology and, and technological improvements, has helped spawn the gig economy. And I'm sure you know people who work in one environment during the day, and then they sell real estate on the weekend, they make jewelry on the weekend, they drive Uber on the, on the weekend, or they might even have two jobs during the day. They like to keep their options open. And employees of this generation, they're not really working for you, they're working for themselves. And that doesn't make them bad people, it doesn't make them bad employees, but let me say it again, for our younger employees, they're not working for you, they're working for themselves. And again, that's okay. Their environment has created this feeling. Nine out of 10 of them said that meaning was most important. And the world is a tumultuous place right now. People wanna make a difference and this generation especially cares about that. So how can we add meaning? Why is it important what your company does? Why is it important what that individual does? How are they helping the world? What's the why from Simon Sinek that is behind what you're trying to do? Generation Z is looking for fast answers and not managers, but mentors. So for my baby boomers out there, I know you want to impart all of your life's lessons to this younger generation. I know you want to help them out. You've learned so much, but you can't just keep beating them over the head with, you should do this, you should do that. This is a generation that has never lived in a time where they couldn't ask their phone or the disc sitting on the counter for a very fast answer. So they're not looking for something they can look up instantaneously. They're looking for somebody who can help mentor them through life, through their organization, somebody who is a little bit more of a parent figure. 
They're also looking for work-life integration. So Generation X was the first one that said, I want work-life balance. Generation Z is looking for that integration. And even before the pandemic, this is a group of people who, you know, maybe they show up to work at nine or 10 in the morning, but they'll give you great outcomes at 2 a.m. They're just putting their life together. And so they are well-suited during the pandemic. But the, the thing that's harder for older generations to understand is that you can't necessarily see them work. I have heard baby boomers and mature say, if I don't see you working, you're not working. But when everybody's working from home, we got to flex that and we got to start thinking about results, not just, you know, can I see you working hard? Like the millennials, Generation Z is, is group oriented. They are diverse individuals. They are multitasking experts. However, they are nonverbal. They are so used to having a phone in their hand, it feels like they were maybe born with it, yet they don't use the phone for actually speaking to people. So they've never had to call to see if a toy was in stock. They've never had to call for a reservation at a restaurant. They haven't called their friends to get together. It's all typing. And as the majority of you on this webinar know, if not everybody, there comes a time when you have to have a hard conversation with a colleague or a customer. And you got to do that at least on the phone, if not in person. If you haven't had that experience, well, it's going to be harder. So here's today's junior associates. Uh, sorry, yesterday's junior associates. <laughs> Pretty vanilla. And here's today's junior associates. So is the guy with the tats and the short tie, is he a bad guy? Is the girl with the pink hair and the nose ring, is she a bad person? And the answer is, you can't tell. Just like they told us when we were kids, you can't judge a book by its cover just because people are gonna look and perhaps act a little bit differently. So what I'd like to talk about now is communicating in the context of your own generation, because it's not enough to say, treat millennials this way, treat Gen Z this way. We've got to think about it in how we perceive the world and then apply it to how they perceive the world. And I recognize this is too small to see, but this is the generational leadership matrix and Margaret's gonna send this out to everybody after the call. Let me just show you a little bit about how it works. So you find yourself across the top, like you are the leader or the person that you wanna, you are the influencing person. So let's say it's, you're a baby boomer. You find your column, then you go down to the row that applies to the person that, that you're interested in communicating with. In this case, we'll call it a millennial. And in each area, you'll see four tips, how to recruit, train, manage, and inspire that generation. So you'll get this document. You can check it out um, you know, at, your, at your own pace and you'll see these tips based on your generation and their generation. So let's talk a, a little bit about best practices and then we'll open it up for Q&A. In terms of those four categories, when it comes to recruiting, here's a great example from Bank of America. You'll see the same language we're talking about. Join our team. We'll guide your ambition through training and mentoring. You'll solve real world problems. You're gonna matter. You're gonna have meaning. When it comes to training, remember that Wall Street Journal example I gave you of the businessman who, who missed his deadline. For managers, think about checking in often. That's what they're used to is, is more constant touch, the younger generation. So if you're older, think about checking in often. If you're a millennial or a member of Gen Z, of course, meet your deadlines, but offer progress reports. Make that manager a little bit more comfortable that, hey, in fact, you're doing the right stuff. 
just a little bit will go a long way in that comfort and it'll keep them from getting on your back. When it comes to the managing best practice, we all know that there are opportunities for you to be able to step in and save the day. And I think about it in the context of when I was flying C-17s, which if you're not familiar, that's a picture of one. I knew that I could let my co-pilot fly that airplane down to about 500 feet on a clear day. And even if he or she wasn't doing the right stuff, I could take control of the airplane and we'd be fine at 500 feet. Below that, it might be dangerous. It's the same way in business or in the academic environment. There's a point at which you can give a, a, a person who is not working on, used to working on projects by themselves a project where less than 100% success is okay, or you know where you can step in and still save the day. So think about where those little projects are and give them to folks so they can learn to work on their own and not necessarily in a team environment. And then millennials and Gen Z, of course, look for small projects on your own to come up with. And lastly, in terms of uh, the, the, the four categories, inspiring. Vail Resorts, the ski resorts, do an amazing thing where they tell their employees, if you can reinforce joy with customers, if you can make their joy better, go do the right thing, act on your own. And so it gives the younger employees the opportunity to try some new things and just you know be creative. So managers and older generations, you gotta be open to new ideas from these younger generations. Uh, millennials and Gen Z have a thick skin though, because believe it or not, maybe some of your ideas have been tried and they're not gonna work. So your supervisors can, can help you out with that balance. So Vail Resorts does an awesome job with this. So Margaret, let's open it up for some live audience questions, please. Great, we've gotten some questions in already, um, and I just encourage everybody to try to go to the, the q and I am trying to monitor both Q&A and chat for uh, questions, um, but um, here um, is a good one. Um, are there differences about the perceptions of generations in other parts of the world? So basically, does what you were saying about that generational leadership matrix still hold true outside of the U.S.? It absolutely does. And, and I've had the opportunity to, to speak and, and, and interact and share these stories worldwide. And, and that's, I, I do see it, it holds true. Now, let me give you a little bit of a nuance. It holds true exactly or very closely in what I would call Western countries. So United States, Canada, Western Europe, uh, and so on. In um, some of the other countries, particularly third world countries, what we see is the, the columns slide a little bit. And so what that means is a millennial acts a little bit more like a generation X person on the matrix. And a gen Xer acts a little bit more like a baby boomer. When we get into third world countries or when those people who were raised in those environment, uh, environments are working in the United States. So you'll, you'll see a little bit of a nuance there, um, but it still works for sure. Oh, great. Um, another question we got is, and I think this is kind of, uh, kind of funny. Um, it, it, I guess it's asking if it's Gen X's fault um, uh, where millennials coddled basically, is that why oh. the way that they are the way they are? And um, is it because of um, you know, Gen Xers being their parents? Um, it, actually, we, we'll, we'll blame that a little bit more on the baby boomers, <laughs> just kind of where those generations lie. It's a little bit more of a baby boomer thing. Um, I don't know this necessarily fault. Here's what has happened. I gave you that scenario of my dad, who was a mature generation, hard feedback, guy lived a hard life. He doesn't want to listen to anybody whining. He's trying to make me tough. And, and I, I'm a Gen Xer, but, but have baby boomer siblings. I, I was the fifth of five. So I kind of got that, you know, more of a, a baby boomer upbringing. 
And, and so what the baby boomers did was they said, hey, wait a minute, this didn't work for me. It didn't work for my friends. This is not the, the best way to do this. I'm going to go the opposite end of the spectrum and, and not necessarily coddle, but I'm going to like celebrate every achievement. I'm going to, um, I- I'm going to make sure that, that my, my son or daughter really feels valued. And, and I'm just going to make sure that darn it, they feel the hug every, every day of their lives. And I'm going to be much more of a friend to them than my parents were to me. Very well intentioned. There were some there were some unintended consequences that came out of that. And that's kind of what we're seeing and in, in what I was describing earlier. Great. Um, all right. So this is an interesting one too. As a manager, um, how do you seem to not be demonstrating favoritism when treating the different ge- generations differently? And they were specifically kind of saying with how you treat um, millennials. So not necessarily favoritism, but different. So for instance, Generation X is like I shared, self-sufficient problem solvers. They don't need you holding their hand. They don't really even want you holding their hand. My number one goal in, in work is to make sure that my boss stops paying attention to me. I'm Generation X. I don't want you looking over my shoulder. So if you give Generation X less attention in terms of what would be perceived as micromanaging, they're going to love that. They're totally cool with that. If you're going to um, help millennials with checking in more often, and it's a frequent touch, but not necessarily um, deeper in terms of you know the, the, the information that you're sharing and all that every single time, they're going to appreciate that. So you're not necessarily playing favorites with the millennials versus Generation X to pick two of them. Um, it's what those guys appreciate. And then, of course, independent of any generation, you talk with your employees and say, hey, Generation X guy, I'm actually giving you less attention. I'm understanding what you're doing. I'm giving you credit for it. Um, you're building that trust with Gen X, but I'm not going to check in with you all the time because I feel like maybe you're not going to appreciate that. And let them tell you. And I would say most of them are going to go, yeah, 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 get out of my business. And then with the millennial, you can do the, you know, have a similar conversation. And, and that way you make sure you're staying um, even, but you're not necessarily playing favorites if you spend a little bit more time with one versus the other. Gotcha. Um, someone from um, one of the younger generations asked, how do you convince someone of an older generation how you'd like to work and that you'd actually be more productive if they permitted it? Mm-hmm. And so if I'm reading between the lines, it might be, I'm not going to be here from eight o'clock in the morning until 5 p.m. Um, maybe I'm going to work some different hours. I need to flex a little bit. That could be probably part of it. Um, starts with having a conversation. And in that conversation, what I've seen work is actually bringing up some of the generational differences. I've had employees come to me and say, Brian, I'm going to play the millennial card on you here. I want to do blah, blah, blah. And it just, it sets a baseline. So for instance, if you've got a baby boomer that says, I want to see you working. I want you working here from eight to five. I want you dressed appropriately. I want you to stand up on the Zoom call so I can make sure you're not wearing shorts with the sport coat and the the dress shirt. Um, I would start talking to them about results. And I'd say, hey, here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to deliver you the results that you're looking for. And I'm going to give you updates along the way to make sure that you know what I'm doing and you're not going to be surprised by a potential failure here on the, you know, at, at the last second. And have a conversation around making that sort of compromise. And, and if you can get their head around it, and, and, and oftentimes we can get their head around, it's about the results, it's about what you're delivering, then you try it. And of course, as a younger generation person, you nail that trial, you totally crush it then they start getting more comfortable with your 
ability to work maybe flex hours or or not always be in the office or um, you know those sorts of things. So I, I, I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm going to um, skip one question and go to this one because uh, I see a, a connection here and it may have been their response to what you were saying. It's how do you actually get a millennial to have the conversation versus text that to you? Oh, well, yeah, you know what? We got to stretch and I see it with uh, with my younger employees will text. They'll even text customers. And the older group will go, oh my God, you're texting. You can't text a customer. It's so, so disrespectful. And then ping, the customer texts right back. And it's like, wait a minute, you actually connected with them faster. So um, it's not like texting is necessarily a bad thing. Um, but you do, uh, as a younger generation, I, I know it's not as common, particularly for Gen Z, but millennials a, a little bit too, to have those face-to-face -face conversations but you got to meet that older generation halfway. So that means you dress nice. If you're seeing them face to face, you got some good posture. You're sitting up, you're prepared for the meeting. You send them a, an agenda ahead of time, at least for this kind of conversation. That brings them halfway toward you. And then you can have that, um, you know, you can have that conversation where it's like, hey, I'd like to try something new. I'm going to get the, get you the results you want. Can we give it a trial? You know, there's a there's a comment here. It's more so than a than a question that I think is very relevant to what you just said, and um, it's the issue with flex time is that if I need info from my employee and they're on their own schedule, I can't get my work done. Some jobs just require certain hours, and that sounds like part of the conversation that needs to take place, that it's not just about the individual's work, it's how it fits into the bigger work ecosystem. Yeah, that's right. And and regardless of what generation we're talking about, you have to do your job and you have to do your job in a, in a timely manner. So so I'm not suggesting that a baby boomer or mature, you know, just flexes out of their mind to make a millennial or a Gen Z person happy. Um, not saying that at all. So if you have a job and you have to be there at certain hours or you have to be able to respond within certain hours, well, then you need to be responding during certain hours. I mean, that's part of the job. If you want to have a conversation about a different job, you can do that. Um, but it does, Margaret, to, to, to that, that comment, and it, it is, um, that's for sure, is that we have to deliver on our jobs. And so um, we can't flex to the point of being ineffective but if we can flex and be at least as effective, if not more so sometimes, well, let's have that conversation. Um, okay, and uh, we are running um, right up um, until our time deadline. So I'm gonna give you one last question that someone was so enthusiastic about, they put it in both the Q&A and followed up in, uh, in chat just now. Okay. Um, if, our future vice presidents and companies are Gen Zs that are not known for communicating well. Are we doomed? And um, there are several question marks that follow. You you are not doomed, and and the and the reason you're not doomed is got a couple reasons. One is you, as a member of the older generation, I'm guessing you're going to help them get better at communicating. You're going to help them and have those conversations face to face, and you're going to be a great coach for these guys. Two is they're going to learn along the way. I mean, the 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 one time that they try to send an email to an irate customer and the customer blows up and 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 makes the deal go away, they're going to learn from that, and it's going to be well before they're a vice president. So just like the rest of us, in different ways, but just like the rest of us, they're going to learn from their mistakes. And they're gonna have mentors and coaches along the way. Hopefully you are one that is gonna help them get better. So hopefully that that resolves at least a few of those question marks. Great. Um, thank you so much for, for a great Q&A session. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. And thanks everybody for asking the questions. That was, that was great. So many came in so quickly. Um, let me just give you the bottom line here as we wrap up. 
we all have this mental image of the perfect employee. And that mental image is largely influenced by our generation. And so if we only view the world through our generation and the lenses of our generation, we miss out. But if we take off those lenses and see other generations for the good that they bring and are aware of the potential shortcomings or aware of where they might struggle, it's then that we get the best out of everybody. And when I say the best out of everybody, I mean the people who work for us, our peers, our families, and maybe even our bosses. I know we didn't get to every question and I know that some people have unique circumstances. Take a screenshot of this. This is my contact information. Let's connect on LinkedIn. If you've got a question, feel free to email me or, or just do it on LinkedIn. Um, my phone number's there too. And then that's a copy of the book Stan Phelps and I wrote together, Great Goldfish. It's got more funny stories. It's got more examples. And in fact, over a hundred best practices from different companies that know how to do the right thing with different generations. So if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to check out the book. Um, and if you've got something specific, you know, absolutely just, uh, just reach out directly to me. Um, I'd love to talk to you. I'd, I'd love to, um, you know, share what I've learned doing the research in, in writing the book. So um, from my perspective, Margaret, you might have something to close up with, but for me, thank you so much. Awesome questions, awesome participation on the polls. Uh, I hope it was, was meaningful to you. I've enjoyed it. So thank you so much. And, and Margaret, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you to close up. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I want to start with the with uh, with that. Uh, thanking you for a fantastic presentation, your time today. I just wanted to let everyone know that we can help um, connect you to Brian too. So if you reach out to yeah. any of us in the um, exec ed team here at Rutgers Business School, we'll we'll make that connection for you as well. Um, but I thought that our um, discussion around generational differences was informative and fun and uh, obviously interactive. We talked about how great um, the audience was, um, Q&A, chat, polls, et cetera. That was uh, fantastic. And as we close, I just want to remind everyone that the RBS Virtual Lunch and Learn series takes place on Wednesdays at noon Eastern. We hope we've made it easy for you to remember by um, scheduling it in the middle of the week and the middle of the day. For 2021, we're aiming for the third Wednesday of each month, and that's kind of in the middle too, some months. Um, for more information, you can always visit our webpage, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. I know that's long, so anyone who has registered will also receive information about it via email. We have an exciting schedule of topics and presenters lined up over the next several months. And that's all thanks to great suggestions we've received from our audience. So we encourage everyone to keep sharing ideas with us. We want the series to continue to meet your needs. So please stay online for just a moment longer when today's webinar closes because you'll immediately see a very brief three question survey about today's event. And one of those questions is a free form field that you can type in topics and or speakers you'd like to see featured in future webinars. Our follow up um, to all of you registered um, will include a copy of the generational leadership matrix, as well as a uh, copy of the archived recording. It will also be um, the recording part will be shared via social media and um, will appear on the Business Insights page of our website. And with that, we are at, back at the top of the hour um, and it's time for us to say goodbye for now. Thanks everyone.